how does the culture differ from a kind of traditional banking culture like Goldman Sachs relative to what you've experienced at big tech? As opposed to tech companies, I think they make a really big effort in giving you the power um, of doing what you think is right. I see a lot of data scientists who do a lot of projects that is that are very cool, but they don't actually do anything. But it's often like you don't think <laughs> about, the, <laughs> about the business context, like what, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What are you actually going to do? Tina, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and now it's happening. Goodness gracious. So, Tina, where in the world do you live? Where are you calling in from? I am calling in from the Bay Area, uh, California. Nice. And then... I don't know if you remember how we initially interacted, how we initially met. Um, so about a year ago, Harpreet Zahota and Kate Stroshny, they were um, they ran a data community content creator award show. And in the run up to that, Harpreet, who was our guest on episode number 457, by the way, really great episode, really fun guy. Um, Harpreet posted on LinkedIn here are some amazing content creators that I recommend you check out and consider using them as nominees for the Data Community Content Creator Awards. And you were one of the YouTubers that he very highly recommended. And so I clicked on your LinkedIn profile. I loved your background. I instantly thought that you would make such a perfect guest for the show. And so I made a LinkedIn connection request. And in that connection request, I asked you if you'd like to be a guest on the program and you just never responded. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, did I like enthusiastically say yes? Did nope. I, okay, did I accept your request? Though? You accepted the request. So I wasn't like heartbroken. Um, but yeah, you didn't respond. And I was like, oh, I guess she's just like really busy. She's just too cool for super data science. Um, but then more recently I had Ken G on the show in episode number five, five, five and you and Ken, are very close. And so I was able to leverage that into a connection to you. And then here we are. That's how I tricked you to being on the show. <laughs> that's actually really funny, though, because I think it's because at that time I was doing connections as opposed to turning on creator mode. And I actually had a script that just accepted everybody. So it, oh. it, it is possible oh, that wow. it could have just accepted it because it was like a lot of effort. You know, like it's like clicking each thing. <laughs> Tina, that is the most elaborate excuse to try to say something kind to me, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> See, I, can't, I can't even make something up like that. You know, that's like, I, I don't have the ability of even making something up like that. So I'm quite yeah, truthful no. most of the time. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. Um, all right. So uh, you're not just famous for your uh, LinkedIn acceptance scripts. <laughs> you're also famous for your YouTube channel, which has over 250,000 followers. By the time that this episode goes live, it'll probably be much, much larger, even growing so quickly. And your channel features technical videos on how to start in data science and things like your SQL Sundays series, your SQL Sundays series, say that three times fast, um, <laughs> which is super helpful for um, interview prep for big tech interviews. Um, but in addition to those technical videos, you also have uh, more general videos on habits, study tips, motivation, and productivity. We're going to touch on lots of these topics in today's episode, but let's start off with uh, one of your most popular video topics. How should somebody start in data science today? Excellent question. Um, I think... First of all, I uh, just want to put a caveat out there, you know, the YouTuber thing, hashtag not, not financial advice. Um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I think, first of all, it really depends 
on what you consider to be data science because data science is such a vast field these days. Like people do so many different things and it's not a career track that's well defined at this point um, cons- like compared to something like software engineering. So just putting that caveat out there. So in my opinion, my humble opinion, there are three different aspects that are extremely important for data science. The first one is coding and programming. The second one is math and stats. So my friends out there, I'm sorry, I can't go away with math and stats here. Um, and the third one is what I, what people usually call like a business where a product sense. Uh, this mm-hmm. one's pretty interesting. And it's one that people don't really uh, think about that much. Um, but kind of like going through each of these quickly, programming is really important. And that's actually where I would recommend people starting, mostly because it's more motivating when you can get something to work. Um, at least for me, I have a very short attention span. So I'm just like, wow, at least it works, you know, and that motivates me. Um, And then math and stats, I also would recommend um, really just starting off with some of that basics, just enough for you to get started on a data science project. I think too many people freak out about math, like, oh, I forgot everything, so I better start from like, I don't know, like calculus and addition and such. And of course, calculus is extremely important, but it doesn't need to come in now. I'm I'm preaching to the choir here. Calculus and addition. <laughs> You're going to want to brush up on the field of calculus and also putting two numbers together. Quite important, <laughs> don't you think, John? I, I do. I do think addition is important. That is one that probably you should brush up on. That is, if if addition uh, is, <laughs> is a topic that you're struggling with, you're going to want to get that down before proceeding too far in data science. The calculus can wait a little. Yes. Yeah. So get your addition down, you know, maybe subtraction if you're really feeling it. But um, at least, so I would say, honestly, like intro statistics, whatever you take in first year, the first couple courses enough to get you started. Like you don't have to go and try to deep dive into everything. If you want to be interested in machine learning, um, just get a general overview of how they work. It's not really necessary for, to, for you to get all the exact details, at least for now. And then the third component in terms of business sense, um, it's, this is what that's pretty interesting. I see a lot of data scientists who do a lot of projects that is that are very cool, but they don't actually do anything. Um, a very good example is someone goes like, oh, um, I'm going to like scrape Spotify uh, or something like that. And then do an analysis like perhaps that could be useful so maybe that's not the best example but it's often like you don't think about (laughs) about the business context like what what's the problem you're trying to solve what are you actually going to do um because that's really important right because whatever fancy thing that you do if nobody cares about it it doesn't really matter how cool it is um and then i also recommend an iterative approach so get the basics down for all these things and then just start working on projects and as you go you're going to start having a lot of gaps in your knowledge and then you can deep dive into these gaps and just work on more projects afterwards. I call this like a breath first approach for any of my CS nerds out there. Nice breath first approach. And yeah, a project based learning. I definitely highly recommend that just get your hands dirty. And yeah, I mean, you could teach yourself addition, for example, through programming. (laughs) Precisely. Like you're like, I forgot how to do addition. And then you're like, do addition. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Just Yeah, experiment with that plus sign in the programming (laughs) language and see what happens. Well, so even for more complex math topics than addition, so for example, calculus, I, in 2020, I got really into relearning partial derivative calculus as it applies to gradients in machine learning. Um, So critical concept, a lot of machine learning algorithms learn with gradients and we need partial derivative calculus to make them happen. So I would simultaneously, I'd get out paper and pencil, and I would derive the partial derivatives of different machine learning cost functions. And then I would calculate, like I'd put in some dummy values, and then I would compute with my hand computed partial derivatives on paper. And then I would go to a Jupyter notebook and I would use PyTorch to differentiate the same equation automatically and make sure that I got the same numbers. So it was a really quick way to check that what I was doing by hand was right. And at that time, I didn't know PyTorch very well. So it was also an entry point for me to learn about PyTorch. So yeah, I don't know. There's kind of an example of how I think this project-based learning that you're describing uh, for learning any topic, including math and stats, is a really great idea. And then we can't forget about your your point about commercial and product acumen. 
this is so, so important to real world data scientists. Like the only place you can get away without that third point that you mentioned is uh, in academia. And even then, you need to be usually coming up with grants that are relevant to something, <laughs> which is kind of a product document in a way. Um, so cool. I love that. All right. Another really popular video of yours, Tina, is on your study system. So even beyond data science topics, for people who want to be able to learn anything effectively, what is your study system? Yeah, so let me preface this again by saying kind of my personality. I'm very easily distractible. Um, <laughs> I give up very easily. I'm being completely serious. I procrastinate like like nobody's business. I, I think even in, in university, I would be like that person who has done nothing the entire semester and then before an assignment or midterm, like freak out like three days before and try to get something done. So that was like Tina prior, right? And that's like my natural state. So in order to control my issues, um, I've come up with a with a system <laughs> that I, I have heard has helped other people as well. So the way it works is, first of all, you need to like, first of all, have a goal, right? If you don't know what you're doing, like if people go like, I want to learn programming, that's like not a very good reason. It's like, what do you actually want to make um, from a very tangible perspective? And then break that down into specific sub goals. So you're able to work through each of these. And of course, these will change over time, right? Because you don't have that much knowledge, but you know, make an attempt. So if you break that down, and you work towards that goal, it's like way more motivating than just kind of like, randomly learning things and hoping that at some point you master the Python, which mm -hmm. by the way is never going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the second one is um, more related to how to actually get yourself to do it. Uh, I have this habit of like getting really excited, making a plan and then doing nothing afterwards and then <laughs> feeling really bad about myself with my like 50 Udemy courses that I bought. Uh, so then I never go on Udemy again. But what <laughs> you do is <laughs> find what pushes your buttons. Like for me, um, that's like a that I'm like a huge people pleaser. So if I tell someone I'm going to do something, I'm so scared that I'm going to disappoint them that I'll make myself do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way that I do this is I actually have a study live stream, which I have four times a week. And I totally like hate myself every time because I don't want to do it. But then I think about my people pleasing and I have to please these people by showing up. So, you know, I show up. That's that's and then they're going to be they're going to like scold me. They always scold me if I don't do it. So I'm just like very, very afraid. So that's how I get myself to to actually do this. Um, third one is mindset. Like consistency is a key. Um, don't really goal yourself in terms of how good you are at something or how good you're becoming. Goal yourself on actually just showing up and doing it. That should be your lowest bar. Um, and then after that, it's having a support system, which again, for me, live stream works out really well support system, they're kind of there, you know, they're here, very supportive, um, as well. And then finally, it's about um, progress, you need a way of tracking progress. Because how are you supposed to know how far along you've come, right? And also, it stops you from pretending that you've made progress, which again, I, I love doing that. But then if the hard numbers are there, you, it's hard for you to like, pretend that you did it. And that's how you can see like your progress towards your goal. It's also very motivating because sometimes, you know, you just feel like you're stuck on something for a very long time. But then looking back at your progress, you actually realize you made a lot of progress. You were just, as they say, um, what was it called? Mistaking the forest or no mistaking? How does yeah, that go? <laughs> that you don't see the forest for the trees. Is that how it goes? Um, yes. So you kind of you get too focused on mm -hmm. the immediate and you lose sight of the big picture. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to be poetic there. So thank you, John. 99% <laughs> of machine learning teams are doing awesome things at a reasonable scale with, say, about four people and two production machine learning models. But most of the industry best practices that we hear about are from a small handful of companies operating models at hyperscale. The folks over at Neptune.ai care about the 99%, and so they are changing the status quo by sharing insights, tool stacks, and real life stories from practitioners doing ML and ML ops at a reasonable scale. Neptune have even built a flexible tool for experiment tracking and model registry that will fit your workflow at no scale, reasonable scale, and beyond. To learn more, check them out at Neptune.ai. That's Neptune.ai. Um, I love that. So you've got to define the goal tangibly and then break it up into surmountable sub goals. 
then you commit, like you somehow, you find a way to commit yourself into it. So, um, you know, commit to somebody else or a group in order to kind of force your hand if you're a people pleaser like you are. And like I am, I actually, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on air, but any project that I ever take on, I have collaborators. I never work on my own. So, and, and it's the same thing. It's just, it's so lonely. And it's, I, I can't get motivated if there's not somebody like waiting for a result or ideally that can actually be doing it alongside me simultaneously. That makes it just so much more enjoyable. So I think it's brilliant how you do your online study sessions um, where yeah, people are going to show up. You've agreed to a time. And even though it's virtual, there is a sense of community and people can ask questions and we probably catch up with people regularly. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Um, and then, yeah, your point that consistency is key is of course important for any for maintaining any habit. Consistency is indeed key. Nice. So uh, speaking of consistency, those points that you just made are wrapped up nicely in a very popular YouTube video of yours on the five steps to consistently do anything. And one of the things that I love about that video is all of the anime <laughs> that you managed to work in. It's very funny and silly. I don't know a lot about anime, but it seems that you do. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked about it is you gave lots of specific examples of how you can have a leaderboard. So in that final piece that you talked about, about being able to visualize progress and avoid um, losing sight of the forest for the trees, um, you can by setting up your own kind of custom way, your own kind of custom metric of tracking your progress, you can then see that and have your own personal uh, leaderboard for tracking your progress. So um, I, I definitely recommend checking that video out, both for the humor of all the anime and the consistent examples about that leaderboard. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that leaderboard or anything else about that video, Tina? Um, yeah, I mean, the question is, did I make the video so I can talk about anime specifically? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I just wanted to talk about anime all along. You know, I'm like, just got, got to like put in some data science here and there. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually have a video dedicated specifically to that scoreboard. But just briefly, uh, we actually review each person's scoreboard in that system during the end of the live streams. So you're oh. keeping... Yeah, it isn't just against yourself. It is, but other people see it as well. So oh. that helps again. Like I said, I build in all these checklists and, and things because I have issues with getting myself to do things. But it also happened to work really well for a lot of other people. So we review the scoreboards after every single live stream and we kind of look at progress. Um, it helps a lot because sometimes, you know, you just don't notice certain aspects. Like maybe over time, you're like, oh, this is not important anymore. Or over time, you realize that you are way too ambitious about something it's, and you need to scope down. So kind of reminding ourselves, okay, it's about consistency and it has to be realistic. Nice. Great tips. All right. So going beyond your YouTube videos to what you do for a living, because believe it or not, despite your massive following and your consistency producing videos that are very popular, that actually isn't your day job. So you work as a data scientist at a very well-known big tech company, but that specific company name remains anonymous so that you can publish content more freely. But despite the name of said big tech company remaining anonymous, I would love to hear about your experience working at a company like this. So I imagine there are lots of data scientists, lots of software developers. When you're a data scientist at one of these big companies, what is the day to day like? What does a data scientist do? It's a great question. So again, there's a lot of different types of data scientists. I think the larger the company gets, the more specialized people get. Mm -hmm. And also it's very dependent on the team that you work on as well, uh, because there's different teams that work on different problems and different products. Uh, for me specifically, I work from, I actually started up working on more product and then it became more of like change teams, became more systems oriented. Um, and then from a day-to-day -day perspective, my day is very variable. I like to describe my job as I'm pretty much a jack of all trades because data science is built nice. upon, yeah, like it's it's pretty much 
<laughs> it's like um, if we need data pipelines that are being built, sometimes I would jump into that. Um, I think it's just because data science in itself is dependent on a lot of different factors. And if you don't have the base that's being laid there, then you can't really do data science. Um, so sometimes I do jump into that kind of work when there's people missing um, from a team. But um, a lot of my job is about, first of all, understanding what that problem is, which is why I talk a lot about understanding like what the business or what it is that you're actually supposed to be doing. Um, and then doing a lot of iterative analyses. I also work mostly on exploratory machine learning models as opposed to deploying them um, mm -hmm. into production. And a lot of it is also cross-functional talk. It's like a lot of different uh, like product managers, um, like software engineers. And then you kind of are in a way leading the direction of the team by using data as a way of doing so. Um, another thing I wanted to point that out is just is the fact that a data scientist's job ultimately, if you have to think about it from a purpose as opposed to so much like exactly what it is that you're doing, your whole idea is that you're trying to use data to solve issues and make and to automate certain things, right? And if you keep that in mind, everything else makes a lot more sense. It doesn't sound as, uh, I guess it is diverse, but it doesn't sound as random as you may think it is. Nice. So... In that sense, we're kind of going back to your point about how critical it is as a data scientist to have a commercial or product acumen. So the kind of the starting point, I guess, for a lot of the work that you do as a data scientist at a big tech company is uh, thinking about what could be better here, what could be more efficient, what could be more profitable, um, you know, where could we have a better experience for our users? Um, so any of those kinds of questions. Um, and so then I guess you probably end up specializing a bit in a, in a company that large, you probably end up specializing in the particular kinds of data that you're working with. Um, uh, or do you end up being able to kind of grab different kinds of data, solve different kinds of problems from all over the organization? It's actually more of the latter. Um, I think, oh, no kidding. yeah, like working in a bigger tech company, um, we're very lucky to have a lot of data being centralized. Like it's in a specific format. Obviously, the nature of the data may be different, um, but you can have access to a lot of different data provided, of course, like uh, we do have like integrity checkpoints. So you can't just like randomly pull data that's not relevant. Um, but you do get a lot of <laughs> access to this. <laughs> all, all of your ex-partners uh uh, private messages. <laughs> exactly. I think that, that would probably get you fired. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then it's, it's actually much more problem based. So I think that's a really cool thing about working in a large company like this is that you get to think a lot about problems and you get to think a lot about things that may be problems that the company doesn't even know. And then you can take that as a project and use the data that is available in order for you to solve that. Cool. I love that. So I actually, I would have thought that you'd end up being hyper specialized, that you'd be working on the same kinds of problems day in, day out, and maybe on the same part of the problem. So, you know, using some specific kinds of techniques or approaches over and over again. But it sounds like not only do you get to solve all kinds of different problems, but on top of that, you described yourself as a jack of all trades. And so it's, yeah, and with the examples that you gave, you're not just working on some specific part of data science, you're going end to end in a lot of situations, it sounds like, um, at least for the exploratory data part. So uh, engineering data pipelines in, and then doing the exploratory data analysis, but it does sound like you often then end up passing the model off to somebody else for the machine learning engineering. Yes, yes. That's another um, really good point. Uh, again, the advantage of working in a really large company is that you get to specialize in the things that you're most interested in. Uh, again, caveat to this is that you can be specialized in a certain um, data structure, like in a certain type of data or the same kind of like problem. That's totally fine for me. Again, short attention span. So I like focusing on different aspects um, by using different techniques in order to do that. Um, but yeah, going back to that point, yes. So 
oftentimes I would do exploratory things and like, hey, this is something that we can consider. And then I would pass that along to software engineers, specifically machine learning engineers. Um, and they are generally the ones that actually deploy and make sure that it works. Um, and just that entire system is, is functional. Nice. So now you actually have a master's degree in computer and information technology from the prestigious University of Pennsylvania. And so you do have some computer science background. Um, how is that helpful for you as a data scientist, um, even though right now you aren't involved as often with the machine learning engineering yourself? Yeah, so uh, it, it was a computer science master's degree. Um, at that time, I just like pretty much didn't know what to do with myself. So if I figured if I get a computer science master's degree, then probably do whatever, which was actually a good choice. I'm like, good job, Pastor. It, it is a really good choice. I mean, I actually I say this on episodes all the time. But if you want to be super employable and have your pick of whatever kinds of problems and industries you want to be working in, even what kind of work schedule you want to have. Specialize in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> and even in like, even for being a data scientist, which I'm sure Tina can elaborate on more, so many things that you do as a data scientist um, can be made easier by that computer science background. Yep, exactly. So um, computer science actually helps me out a lot. Um, like, don't tell anyone, you know, I didn't actually get any official training in data science. Most of it is self-taught. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, having that CS background is super helpful because as you were saying earlier, John, like you would sometimes... Uh, be like working through a math problem and then you would kind of just test it out, right? Uh, so from a CS perspective, a lot of machine learning uh, nowadays is quite automated. Um, so you can actually just call it and play around with it and build stuff with it, even though you don't really know what's happening under the hood. Um, so that's been really helpful in terms of me learning specific things. So I would start implementing things and then I would start like building out smaller versions of it and learning very quickly. Um, also, uh, the CS degree, it's very problem solving based because I think what a lot of uh, computer science is like if you want to specifically say like software engineering for example uh, which is technically what most of my peers ended up doing it's like you have a problem and you have no idea how to do it and then you just kind of like figure it out and then you get like cryptic things and then you fix it. So what you learn is a lot of patience and that has been very helpful um, instead of just like rage quitting. So I, I would attribute that to my computer science degree because I was definitely a lot less patient before, but I kind of, um, what is that called? How should I say it? Got like my ego beaten up. Um, from doing a CS master's. So now I'm just like, oh, I have no idea what's happening, but that's fine. <laughs> Nice. It's, it's, it's great to hear that. That's such um, a, a candid way of describing what it's like to be a software developer or a data scientist most of the time that you don't really understand what the problems are. And you just you're constantly every day as a data scientist or a software developer, you're getting problems thrown at you where you don't understand maybe even the question that's being asked of you by a person or the question that's being presented to you by some data or some error. And then through Stack Overflow and um, through time and patience and um, by figuring out how to make your way through the stack to where the problem is. And kind of, there's a lot of like working forwards, working backwards. You like, you start with this big nebulous problem and then you just try to chip away at it, chip away at it until you figure out, okay, it's gotta be this line of code. Mm -hmm. Like this is where the mistake must be. And then, and then often that can be the most frustrating part. So I have <laughs> dozens of times in my career, I've gotten to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm 100% sure the problem must be this line of code. But this line of code is perfect. <laughs> and so somehow the computer is just not doing the command. It's like, it's, it's doing the opposite of what it should be doing somehow. Like, like there's like a flip bit that just happened <laughs> randomly somewhere. Um, but then somehow, like an hour later, you're like, oh, oh, how did I miss that? Yeah, there, that is definitely a problem in this line of code. Um, so another, yeah. sorry, uh, another thing I learned from computer science uh, is that if you don't know what's happening, just turn it on and off. If you just turn it on and off, <laughs> maybe it'll work. <laughs> and that actually helps a lot of times. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. Yep. The, the old off and on. Definitely a tried and true computer science trick. Um, th- that must be like uh, maybe maybe a first year grad student course at University of Pennsylvania. The old off and on 501. Yeah, pretty much. It's like, that's like every single course, especially when you're dealing with hardware and you don't know what's happening. Like you just literally just turn it on and off repeatedly until it works. <laughs> Great. Einblick is a faster and more collaborative way to explore your data and build models. It was developed at MIT and showed to reduce time to insight by 30 to 50%. Einblick is based on a novel progressive engine, so no matter the data size, your analysis won't slow down. And Einblick's novel interface supports the seamless combination of no-code operations with Python code. This makes Einblick the go-to data science platform for the entire organization. Sign up for free today at einblick.ai. That's E-I-N-B-L-I-C-K dot A-I. E-I-N-B-L-I-C-K dot A-I. All right, so in addition to your background, your formal education in computer science, Tina, you also worked as an intern at Goldman Sachs before getting your big uh, big tech job. So um, how does the culture differ from a kind of traditional banking culture like Goldman Sachs relative to what you've experienced at big tech? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I think at places like Goldman Sachs, to give them credit, they are trying to innovate. Um, and Goldman Sachs is probably one of the finance companies that are the most innovative and they believe in engineering and they believe in data. However, it's also an institution that's been around so long and it's very difficult to fully uh, change the culture as well as just the the infrastructure inside, right? right. Um, so one of the big things that still exists, even though uh, they're trying to get rid of, is this difference between front office and back office. Right. Engineering, data science, we're considered back office, right? Mm. People who are investment banking, traders, they're considered front office roughly, I believe. Don't quote me on that one. They um, are. That I can confirm. <laughs> oh, okay. I was going to say hashtag not financial advice. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there is that difference between um, just the way that you're being treated at that point and the amount of resources that you do get. Um, right. And not going to lie, there's also prestige differences, right? So people yeah. like view you differently, especially within the organization, not so much like outside. It's it's more like, oh, you're like in engineering or you're doing like data stuff, then they don't take you as seriously. So that's one of the components. Um, and so another one is just the how do I say, like the technology that's there, it's it's obviously not cutting edge, right? There's a lot of investment that goes into it, but it's really not cutting edge like the way that tech is. They're not, they're finance, like, you know, you, you don't just go like, oh, let me like innovate on this thing, right? So there's a lot of um, regulations that are yeah, there. Yeah, compliance issues around any change. Mm-hmm, exactly, exactly. Uh, so there's also that. And in terms of, I would also say the caliber of people, um, is specifically in engineering and the, I guess like I kind of grouped them together. Uh, us folks in the back office, I suppose. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. Uh, but basically engineering people, people in data science and such, data engineering. Um, I'm not saying that they're not high caliber people, uh, but generally they are less motivated because a lot of the times people are telling you what to do. Right. right. Um, as opposed to tech companies, I think they make a really big effort in giving you the power um, of doing what you think is right uh, and what you think is important. And engineering, of course, and data science, even if you want to go off like a totem pole, which I think it's like there's a lot less of there's like a lot more like you're people like people will listen to you, you know, if you think certain things, um, leadership, business, like business leaders, they will actually listen to you. Um, if you can show them the data, as opposed to, um, somewhere like Goldman Sachs, where a lot of it is still decided based upon seniority, um, and the position that you're in. Yeah. So I think there's, I, my understanding from those kinds of big banks is that, um, in order to have a big impact, you often ha- kind of have to develop a personal relationship with somebody higher up. Mm. Um, and then you could potentially be feeding them these 
great ideas and great data. And then <laughs> hopefully that person is giving you some credit, um, but sometimes they don't, uh, or so I hear. <laughs> um, so super cool. All right. Um, so that gives us a little bit more on your background. Another cool thing about your background is that your undergrad from the University of Toronto is in pharmacology. Um, so the study of pharmaceutical substances and how they act. Um, so super cool, a biology specialization. And you also, uh, uh, right after that, you worked as a research assistant at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. So does any of that, your background in pharmacology or cancer research, does that still make an impact on what you're doing today as a data scientist at a big tech company? Yeah, I've been, I've been like, you know, we've been kind of flitting around for a while, huh? It's like first biology, uh, and then I'm like pre-med, that didn't work out. So let's do some bioinformatics, and then let's go into finance for a bit, and now we're in tech. Um, well, I did, the, I did the same thing. Really? I should yeah. know that. So during my undergrad, my intention was to go to medical school, and then I got sidetracked because... I got invited to do a PhD. So I was like, oh, that'd be a good idea. I could still do an MD afterward, be an MD PhD. And that was all in bioinformatics. Um, uh -huh. And so, yeah, so I have a PhD in neuroscience, uh, but so I specialized in creating algorithms that could be applied to very large data sets like brain imaging data sets or genomic data and identifying patterns, causal patterns in some cases. And yeah, and then I worked in finance as a trader. <laughs> oh, wow. So the, the parallels are, are actually pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now, I, would you consider yourself working in tech now? Uh, definitely, yeah. So I've been working in tech for eight years. Um, not big tech, small tech <laughs> uh, at a small startup, but uh, yeah, definitely in tech. Wow, I guess there must be some sort of parallel in personality then. <laughs> yeah, I, well, actually, so I could kind of, I could, I could tell you my thinking kind of along the whole way. So, you know, I wanted to make a big impact and really help a lot of people. And I enjoy working with people. And so I thought medicine would be a really good fit. But then by the time I finished my PhD, I talked to enough people who had, who were friends of mine in my undergrad who had actually become doctors and it started to sound like it wasn't as great on the ground as it seemed like as an idea that uh, people are very difficult to change. So um, a lot of the patients that you see have a lot of comorbidities, smoking, mm -hmm. alcoholism, um, obesity. So a lot of patients, you know, they have, you know, all of these comorbidities and it's just saying to them, well, you know, you got to exercise a bit more. You've got to, you know, cut out a hundred calories a day for a few months. Like people, it's very difficult. It's rare to find patients apparently that actually listen to that advice and change. And so you kind of you end up having the same people come back who aren't taking care of themselves. Apparently that can be pretty frustrating. And also for me, um, it doesn't scale up very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can only work on one patient at a time. Um, unlike when you develop a platform or a product where it does scale really nicely, especially with software. Um, so that was something. So for me, and then, so by the time I finished the PhD, I was like, well, you know, all these, you see all these academics, postdocs struggling. And I was like, I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> uh, I'll work in finance. They make lots of money. And then after doing that for a couple of years, I was like, oh, you know, making lots of money for its own sake, that, I don't know, I couldn't stay motivated about it for very long. Um, and then so, yeah, data science was this perfect for me, and maybe you feel the same way. This is really your episode, so I'm talking way too much. But I, for me, data science is this beautiful career path because you get to make a huge impact. Lots of data that we can then use to improve products and services, automate things. You can make a massive impact. The problems that you solve are constantly changing. They're intellectually stimulating. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of the best of everything. You get to make a commercial impact in the end because you're solving interesting problems on a big scale. And so, yeah, 
get a yeah. So I, I absolutely love data science and I've really felt like I've I've been in the right place now um since making that transition. How about you? <laughs> I mean, you pretty much summarize a lot of my thinking as well. Um, in addition to the pre-med part, one of the reasons is I figured my personality wouldn't work so well um, in medicine unless I was a surgeon because I'm very much to like, yay, like let's, let's like, I, you know, I'm like a very excitable person. I would imagine that you don't want your doctor to be very excitable. Like you would like them to be solemn. And that's like definitely not what I'm very good at. <laughs> you know, like if, I'm, if you're just like, yay, you're here again. Like, like that's probably like not not the best, you know. I guess like uh, in surgery you can do whatever you want because <laughs> they're they're under anesthesia. Um, so that was one of the reasons. Also, like having a, a, a like in addition to that, um, what you're saying about the impact, I really do see that because technically there is a lot of impact in medicine, but it's really hard to do that as a doctor because you're working like seventy two hour shifts. I don't think you have much time uh, to think about anything else. Um, there's, yeah. there's also, so there's a great organization called 80,000 Hours that tries to help you figure out how to make a big impact in your career, but mm -hmm. also to find something that you're good at and that you're passionate about. So try to kind of help you figure out what the optimal career choice for you is. Mm -hmm. And so we actually had um, Ben, Ben Todd, who is one of the founders of 80,000 Hours. And by the way, that name 80,000 Hours comes from kind of average number of hours that you work in your career. Um, and so Ben Todd was on the program in episode 497. It was one of the most popular episodes of 2021. Um, and so he is not um, a specialist in data science in particular, but he did a lot of research for his episode appearance. And so in addition to general career guidance, he also had a lot of specific career guidance. And so through that episode or through the 80,000 hours blog, you can read lots about lots of different kinds of careers and making career decisions. And one of the interesting things that they have, um, have said in one of their blog posts on medicine specifically is that in terms of your net impact, if you decide to become a doctor, your net impact on the world is on average zero. Because if you didn't get into med school and become a doctor, somebody else would have. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't actually like on average move the needle very much. Yes, some doctors could be more impactful than others. And maybe, you know, you could really make some big difference, but on average, you're, you're not going to, it's going to net out to zero. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways. Kind of going back to your original question. I'm sorry, I totally <laughs> sidetracked here. It's like how, no, how much- sidetracked. <laughs> How much does um, that degree in pharmacology actually help out now? Uh, I think it may be surprising to say that it helps out just as much as computer science does. Um, oh, wow. I think it's very interesting because I certainly wasn't like, I think I'm going to be pre-med and then I'm going to go do a computer science degree so I can become a good data scientist. I thought that didn't happen, but it somehow really worked out. Um, and that's because I always say data science is oftentimes really about exploring things, like understanding things through a, a data perspective, right? And in a way, that's what science is as well. It's about um you have a problem, you try to figure it out using a scientific method, and you have the data and you try to draw conclusions about it. It just so happens that for uh, data science, you have more data and you have different techniques of doing so. So maybe instead of doing surveys, maybe instead of just analyzing small data sets, you just happen to have bigger data sets. And instead of um, analyzing things using certain software, you just use you just code your your software and you use different modules to do that. But I think the essence of data science is is actually very similar. I would say it's actually the same as the scientific method. Uh, also, the stats kind of helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The the stats that you learn in uh, any quantitative science degree, along with that kind of critical thinking you're describing, the scientific method, in a lot of ways. That is what data science is. Um, add in some more software development usually, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big component. Um, super cool, I love that answer. So speaking of um, software uh, and using software to solve problems, what are the software languages that you use regularly uh, now that you're in Big Tech? I think I'm gonna spark some um anger here i actually use both Yay. python and r wow uh, no, you're, 
<laughs> just sitting on the fence. Uh, I actually, I, I, yeah, I also use both. Because they're actually very specialized for, for different things. You know, Python's a great general language um, to do stuff in, much better for machine learning as well. Um, and then you can integrate that a lot. But I would say in terms of stats and visualizations, uh, R, R is actually quite, is, is better than that. Um, and at the base of all of this, I uh, use a lot of SQL because oftentimes if you can solve a problem using SQL, it's the easiest and the fastest way of doing so. So that's always my first approach. Nice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that. Yeah. I mean, Python and R are different tools. And the, the way that you describe them, Python being a general purpose programming language, totally agree. Super helpful for any machine learning model that's going to end up being engineered in production. If you know that that's going to be the case in advance, maybe you should be starting with Python uh, right from the scratch. However, for working with um, maybe not the biggest data sets out there, but if you're going to be working with data that you can fit on a single uh, machine, then doing statistical analysis with R and data visualization. Yeah, I, it's it's so intuitive to me. I mean, it was designed by statistics people <laughs> as opposed to software developers. And so a lot of the way that it looks and feels, including being one indexed instead of zero indexed, um, <laughs> reflects that. Um, so I love that perspective. And then I also love your perspective on how SQL, if you can just use that, is going to be the quickest way to pull your data out and uh, do some analyses with it. So speaking of SQL, you have a SQL course on 365 Data Science. So you have your SQL Sundays series of YouTube videos on YouTube, uh, which are freely available. And then you also have this SQL course. So how's that different from what you have on YouTube? Kind of walk us through um, what this curriculum is in 365 Data Science. Yeah, for sure. So um, it really all started off with the SQL Sundays, and that's when I take a interview question um, and I walk through how to do it. So I have a specific system I always use um, when doing interviews, uh, especially like SQL interviews. So I always walk through that process, whereas I get really nervous and I forget everything. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's really helpful for people who are, you know, looking into doing interviews and how to like approach different questions. Um, for in terms of my course, I actually made it so that it's 10 complete interviews with an interviewer start to finish. And wow. it's... Cool. Yeah. So it's like more expanded upon that because um, one of the challenges I faced when I was trying to study for the interviews is that there really wasn't a resource that shows you what the entire process looks like. And in my opinion, grinding a lot of questions is not the best approach of doing well in these interviews. It's really understanding what the person, what the interviewing interviewer is looking for and oftentimes after you do a problem even before you do a problem right they will deliberately ask you things that are rather vague and the expectation is for you to clarify these things because on the job that's exactly what people are going to do like ask you very vague things and you need to be able to clarify it and then after you do the problem there's going to be like follow-up questions that are going to be like related to okay like how do we use this and what about different perspectives um and that's also you know, that's not something that you will get experience in if you're just kind of grinding problems um, when when you're just um, practicing on cer certain platforms with interview questions. Nice. Really cool. Sounds like a great course. If I'm ever interviewing for a big tech company or maybe even just to brush up on my SQL, that sounds like a great resource. Um, I particularly like how you highlight there how uh, interview questions, the interview process with a human, as opposed to when you're just getting very structured questions that are written down, that human is testing in a lot of ways, your ability to distill what the question really is, and to uh, refine down um, from some originally vague parameters. Um, so very different, that human experience relative to getting, you know, if you're just doing SQL questions, they're on, because they're not interactive. Uh, if you if, if you're just if you're doing ones that are written down, uh, doing that kind of road practice, it's going to be relatively straightforward. Like so that the answer might not be easy to figure out, but the way that the question is presented is typically going to be easy to understand. Cool. All right. So before we move on to audience questions, I've noticed from conversations that I've had with you in the past, as well as a lot of your videos, that you seem to be standing a lot of the time. 
So is that a productivity hack or a life hack of some kind? What are the what other tricks do you have other than the study tips, the uh, the tricks for consistently doing anything, tricks for being a great data scientist that you've covered so far? Do you have any other general productivity or life hacks like standing? <laughs> I mean, the standing one just comes from the fact that my back hurts a lot. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would be honest with you. Uh, that's totally what happened. Like I'm sitting here because I figured, you know, it's probably better if I not just stand there. It's a bit, a bit, a bit awkward. Um, but yeah, it's just because my back hurts. I got a standing desk and then I hide my chair usually. So I don't feel like sitting on my chair. Uh, also, just my back hurts so much. I have like a variety of different massage guns <laughs> and different things to make my back feel better. It's probably during my undergrad days, you know, when you just kind of have terrible posture and sit there memorizing drugs in the middle of the night. At least that was, what it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> because of your pharmacology degree or because of extracurricular studies? <laughs> oh, pharmacology, of course. Why would you even ask? <laughs> <laughs> memorizing a bunch of drugs. Yeah. Um, There's well, okay. a... Oh, sorry. There's another one that I do have. Uh, I mean, audio folks, I apologize. You wouldn't be able to see, but it's a physical timer um, that right. I use. So in terms of Pomodoros, I generally use a physical timer because I get very distracted by everything. Again, you know, I just have issues with being distracted by everything. So mm -hmm. I just have this physical timer I put here. And I, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, wow, I should be studying or doing whatever. Uh, so I do that. I generally just try to make everything very, very physical um, and try to not use my phone. And another thing that I do, unfortunately, also got some tea stains on it. But this is what I have over here. It's a pack of cards. Haven't come up with a better name. Um, what it has on the front is Memento Mori. And this is very motivating to me. Um, it means remember you will die. But it's not as pessimistic. It means that you should probably live if, you know, remembering that at some point we are mortal people. We are mortal, mortal creatures. So you should be doing the things mm, that... for yourself. Oh, yeah, true. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, you can just upload your consciousness or something like that, right? Um, but yeah, so in this pack of cards, uh, I have the things that are very important to me. So the first one is learning. The second one is health. Um, the third one is business. And the fourth one is finance. Uh, I have this general goal of financial freedom, location freedom, time freedom, and what I pretentiously call intellectual freedom, which is my ultimate purpose where I just want to sit there and do things that I think are the most important without having to worry about things like money. Um, and so that's one of my goals and the family career romance here. I have not die alone. So that's kind of like my goal, um, <laughs> which I remind myself of every day. So yeah, I go through these pack of cards and then whenever I feel like I just want to sit there and watch anime, which is like every day, I look at this. I'm like, oh, right. Uh, this is very important. If I keep watching this anime, I'm going to die alone. Yes, um, precisely. <laughs> um, so that Memento Mori, I believe you also have a YouTube video on that. I think I've seen that on your channel. Yes, I do. It's so, um, how I motivate myself to, to do things. Nice. All right. So we'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. A really great tip there. And I do love the idea of having a physical Pomodoro timer. So for those of you who aren't aware of the Pomodoro focus and productivity technique, I did an episode on that, um, episode four, five, six of the program. Um, and yeah, I use, um, I just use a timer on my phone, but I can definitely see the advantage in using a physical timer because then I could force myself to have the phone out of the room would definitely in some situations be helpful um, on focusing me. Okay, so I posted on LinkedIn and Twitter asking before the episode if people had questions for you. And it is one of the most popular posts I've ever made. Um, so thank you for engaging with it. I think that your giant LinkedIn audience uh, engaged with my post. So definitely appreciate that. Um, and we had tons of people. There are dozens of people who have written comments saying what a huge impact that you have made on their on their life and on their data science career. So uh, yeah, clearly you have a really devoted uh, following and you're making a big impact with them. Uh, That's why I keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, like we could 
honestly, like it's, it's very difficult starting off um, trying to go off YouTube, especially for me, like I've never really used social media, but really it's, it's what motivates me because I see that the things I do are having impact and from a selfish perspective as well, because it forces me to become better, right? So I can keep creating that impact and helping people. Nice. Well, <laughs> so yeah, so there were a lot more comments and praise for you than there were specifically uh, questions, but <laughs> so it's very Ken, flattering. <laughs> Kenji, who was in episode number 555, um, he would like to know how many cats and plants you think you will own in 10 years? <laughs> I believe I said at least three. You um, did. And then he wrote more like 300. Yeah, actually, it kind of depends on how many I can fit into this room. And, and the plants thing, I kind of just, you know, I don't know. One day I was like, I think I'm going to get plants. And then I got a lot of plants. And I definitely went over my spending goals um, on, on that month. So I, I guess I'm not really sure I have a good reason for that. <laughs> However, I'm not sure this is interesting at all to anybody. So you see my, my two cats right now are called Beep Beep and Boop. Uh, I think my next cat I'm going to call Poop. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I, I don't know like it just occurs to me you know I think that'll be quite good <laughs> that makes a lot of sense because that's the third noise that computers make <laughs> beep beep boop and poop <laughs> pretty much um, and uh, okay so we do also have a serious question here from Brinda so Brinda works in data science and analytics and she would like to know Tina about a time when you didn't have enough data to make a decision? What did you do? How did you handle that situation? I think that's a great question. Um, I would actually say most of the time you don't have enough data because you don't have a very, you don't have like a full grasp of um, everything that's happening, right? And when what it really is, is you take advantage of the things that you have. Um, you also take advantage of domain knowledge and intuition. Um, data science is an art as much as it, as it is a science, as well as you try to understand things, like you try to gather knowledge from the people around you as well. And that really helps drive um, a lot of uh, a lot of what you can do. And actually interesting a lot enough, one of the jobs, one of the teams I was working on previously, there was no data because we were starting from scratch. And what's fascinating is that's really when you start realizing that it's the scientific method, right? Even when you don't have any data, um, it's about thinking through a problem, having a hypothesis, testing that out um, as with whatever it is that you have, and then just kind of reiterating um, throughout throughout this process. So to answer your question, maybe it's like not as specific um, as it would like to be, but it's just think through the problem and then use whatever resources it is that you have and understand that even when you have a lot of data, the decision is never absolute. Um, so you just make your best guess. And then when you actually, since you have a hypothesis, you can start testing things out. And maybe you were, you were wrong, right? But at that point, you would know that you're wrong. You would have the data that you're wrong. And then you can keep refining from there. Nice. That is a great answer, Tina. Yeah, it wasn't very specific. But in its generalness, it was very helpful indeed. All right. So yeah, so that's it. Those are all the questions that came up for you from the audience. Um, so then we are reaching the end of the episode. Do you have a book recommendation for us? Yeah. So the book that last made me cry was A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. Um, it's a really great book. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you guys, but it'll make you cry a lot, I think, unless you're, you know, you have a heart of steel. Um, oh, no. I, I, I cry reading almost every book and watching almost every movie. So I, <laughs> I'm sure it'll work for me. <laughs> oh, actually, you should definitely check it out. Um, it's about this guy who pretty much like gets successful. Um, but then he's like, well, okay, now what should I do with my life? Right. And then he kind of, you know, degenerates and, and such. Um, and then he just, you know, goes on a journey, does a bunch of things, learns a lot of, um, life lessons, I suppose. And I don't think I'm going to spoil anything by saying this, like a really big thing that he encompasses just throughout the entire thing is like, if you're gonna, um, like what makes a good life is also what makes a good story. And so story is pretty boring if you just sit there and do the same thing every day, right? You don't challenge yourself. Um, so that's kind of what it is. Like if you want to see a life, a good life is the same as trying to make a good movie. And you should still, you should definitely read it because he's very good at writing. Um, and yes, I was just like crying in the middle of the night. A million um, years in a thousand. Oh, a, a million, million miles, miles in a thousand, thousand years. years. 
Yeah. Boom. All right. Thank you for that great recommendation. And then obviously for people to follow you, keep up with your latest, your YouTube channel is your number one recommendation, I'm sure. Um, but in addition to that, where else should people follow you? LinkedIn seems like you have a lot of followers there. Yeah, I'm trying to get better at LinkedIn. Like I said, I don't, gen- I actually don't personally use any social media. So, you know, you can't really find that much to embarrass me with as people have <laughs> tried personally. Um, but LinkedIn, I'm going to try my best um, to be more active there. But I'm also going to start a newsletter pretty soon. So a lot of that, I'm um, going to start posting more, just trying to understand what people are interested in on LinkedIn. Also, uh, I have a Discord, which you can find the link, I think maybe in the, not sure if in the podcast is it called the description um yep, in the show notes in the show notes yes i maybe we can put that there but it's also linked in my youtube it's a very active discord community people study a lot um yeah i mean i troll around once in a while <laughs> but it's, it's actually a very community run like i don't like pretty much like it the community runs itself it's like i'm not the one dictating what's happening or anything like that but if you comment and talk to me there i am very likely to respond <laughs> Nice. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Discord, wonderful. Lots of ways to keep up with Tina. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's been so much fun. You are such an engaging communicator, uh, so bubbly, uh, and have tons of knowledge to share with us. Thank you so much for joining. And hopefully it won't be too long before you're on the show again. Thank you. Who says you can't learn and have fun at the same time? We certainly did today. In today's episode, Tina filled us in on how coding, math, and commercial acumen are the three key areas to focus on if you're getting started in data science, her five steps to consistently doing anything, namely defining your goals tangibly, breaking those into surmountable sub-goals, committing to the goal to someone else, having a support system, and being consistent. She also talked about how data scientists at big tech firms focus on solving issues and creating value more so than engineering their models into production systems. She talked about how she regularly uses Python for general purpose programming, R for statistics and visualization, and SQL for database queries. She also talked about how her SQL course practically prepares you for data science interviews and how her scientific background helps her draw conclusions as a data scientist, while her computer science background has provided her with much patience for problem solving. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Tina's YouTube channel and social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 563. That's superdatascience.com slash 563. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like several audience members did of Tina during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter, as that's where I post who upcoming guests are, and ask you to provide your inquiries. Thanks to my company Nebula for supporting me while I create content for you. And thanks, of course, to Yvonne Siebert, Mario Pombo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogwang, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another super fun episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.